so a minute early. You can start with the introduction. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I'm David. I'm here to introduce Lars, talking about building reliable Ceph clusters. Um, I'd love to talk and fill in some time, but I didn't. Um, so instead, I'd just like to, everyone, please give me a round of applause. Say thank you. Yeah, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. It's my first time in Australia. Um, it's been a long way. Today, you get the benefit of me no longer being completely jet lagged. Um, but I developed this after this great penguin dinner. I, you know, um, this deep voice just for you. And so today, I would like to talk about building reliable Ceph clusters. I've been building distributed systems for a while, um, longer than I care to admit because it betrays my age. And I'm trying to do that in 45 minutes. And that thing that you see there is an interrobang, which after I looked at that and realized that it's a pretty tall order. So I will either speak really fast or I go at one slide per minute, right? Um, because I also realized I'm apparently looking at the conference program. I'm the only Ceph talk at this conference, which is uh, completely new compared to all the other conferences I go to. So I can't rely on everyone knowing what Ceph is, and I actually have to do the introduction. Um, so as you can probably guess, I'm working for SUSE, but I debranded all the slides except for you know using the corporate template. So this is really a community talk. I'm not going to talk about any of our products. Um, I also represent SUSE on the Ceph advisory board, which is basically a talking shop for all the people coordinating the Ceph-related activities and marketing efforts. Um, yeah, and with that, let's dive right in. Um, I will start with what this is not. Um, this is not a comprehensive introduction to Ceph, because then you would, the doors would lock and you would not be getting out of here for the next few days. And you would have to survive on morning and afternoon tea, which I would suggest is not a thing. Um, there's just too much, right? It's just, just too much. Also, a Ceph roadmap session um, is not what I'm going to do. I will not talk about a lot of the features that are in and out and what's happening, because it's, again, too much going on. Um, and it's also not a discussion that primarily focuses on performance tuning of a distributed storage system, right? The performance plays a role in dependability. You have to be fast enough to satisfy your users' needs and meet your SLAs. But it's really not, again, there are so many factors that affect performance tuning that just listing them all literally takes an hour. I have another talk that does exactly that and leaves everyone with more questions than answers. Um, so with that, again, um, let's, let's do a quick introduction of Ceph, right? Um, first, before I go into the next slide, who here knows what Ceph is? Excellent, I don't have to do the round level introduction after all, just you know, not for everyone, but I will, I will do it anyway. So what is Ceph, right? It's an open source defined soft, uh, software defined storage project. And crucially, it has multiple front ends. So it's a multi-protocol solution. Um, it gives you S3, Swift, native Linux block I.O. called Rados block I.O., uh, Rados block devices, heterogeneous block I.O. access via iSCSI gateways. There's a native Linux network file system called CephFS, um, heterogeneous <laughs> network file system access with NFS Ganesha. So I wouldn't recommend using that for production just yet. We'll get there. Um, Low-level interfaces to the block storage algorithm, and there's, you know, it does everything, right? Linux, Unix, Windows, applications, cloud, and Docker, 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 right? So it's all, it's all there. It doesn't have, we, we're still trying to figure out how to fit blockchain somewhere in. Um, that's apparently, we, we're missing out, right? We need a ledger somewhere. Um, this is all built on the common, smart, and very feature-rich backend store called Rados. Um, and that's uh, for the pseudo-random algorithmic data distribution algorithm to live. And that is a consistent, reliable, I have a slide where expands acronym I can never remember. Um, so, and what is software-defined storage actually, right? So we are all familiar with traditional rate arrays, um, where basically building the array is someone else's problem, and you just hook it up to your system, and you get storage, right? That were the fun old days. Um, they were expensive old days, but at least it wasn't your fault, right? Software-defined storage is basically you take a bunch of CPUs, memory, a bunch of network cards, a few switches, disk drives, and quite a bit of power, 
right? Um, you add Ceph, you add an operating system, which just in this example happens to be SUSE, don't know quite why, and a management front end typically, and win, right? You're done, right? You get files, you get block, you get containers, you get cloud storage. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, it's a slightly simplified view. Um, on the other hand, this also means that all those things and all the ways how they interrelate and how you hook them up are suddenly your problem. Um, and that's where we, where we get started. So a more logical view of a Ceph cluster is basically that you have those storage servers where they run the so-called object storage demons that basically map a single drive into the Rados object store. Um, and you have, typically you have a bunch of storage servers with a bunch of disks each. Um, it just have really only ma starts making sense once you have more than, like, say, four or five servers and you know ten drives each. Below that, you should probably be using something else. Um, and then you have a bunch of monitors that sort of like keep track of what's up and what's down. And that's basically the core of the Rados object storage thing in the back. And then on top of that, you have the various access mechanisms, right? The common ones: block devices. We're all familiar with block storage, I hope. Um, object storage is this S3 Swift thing that's really great, but a lot of applications in the enterprise world that I happen to live in have no idea how to deal with something that's object storage. Um, and then you have file interfaces like CFFS or eventually export it to NFS or SIFS, where you know the various gateways. So that's that's a logical view. I have a slightly less pretty slide, but where it's a little bit easier to see. You have you know really a lot of OSDs, a lot of disk drives. Um, and then the various gateway processes. And this is fairly interesting. This is a metadata service. Those are the gateway processes that actually interface to file systems. So the metadata servers are sort of like caches that keep, because if you had to update an object every time you wanted to t change an, an M time flag, you would be generating a lot of network traffic, and that would not be good. So that's basically how a Ceph cluster operates. And ah, there we go. And how does Ceph actually decide where your data goes? It uses a so-called CRASH <coughs> algorithm, and that's a reverse acronym for Controlled Replication Under Scalable Hashing, so your data gets crushed. Um, and what it basically means, and that's really new in the Ceph world, it's a distributed hash algorithm, and there's no centralized authority or lookup table. Right? So you when a client wants to know where a piece of data lives, it doesn't have to go and ask a server. Um, you know, I really need block one of file A, where does it live, but it can compute that locally and then directly go to the OSD. That happens even for CephFS, um, so they all know how to talk to the metadata service, but all the data I owe is direct, which really helps with scalability. So the monitors, they're critical in that they maintain the state of the cluster and the map and the, basically the configuration parameters and distribute that to the clients, but they're not part of the I.O. path, so they're not really, you know, performance critical. Um, so that's, you know, and when you do that, you end up with a lot of, um, a lot of storage all hidden be underneath Ceph, right? So it's autonomous, so you don't, in theory, you don't have to worry, it's all magic, right? Um, so Ceph gives you a bunch of access mechanisms, and the question is, what of that should you actually use? Um, and a lot of features, you know, what features should you use? And basically use only what you need, but exactly only what you need. Don't use everything. If you use every feature of Ceph, like with every software product, you're using a lot of complexity. Your solution gets very complicated to understand and very hard to debug. Um, that's great if you're like us selling support. Um, it's not so great if you actually want the system to work in production. Um, so you really want to keep simple, conservative deployment. So I know this is not the Docker way, you, but conservative is like I've been building HA clusters for most of my life. If you want the system to be reliable, you really want to you know, develop a more conservative attitude. It doesn't mean that you should disregard the features or not work on them, but you really should pick you know, the minimal set. So on this list, Rados block device access is probably at this point the most stable. Um, this is, you know, block device export from a Ceph cluster is the most straightforward way to access it, if you can. Um, S3 and Swift interfaces for Amazon and OpenStack compatibility are also very, very mature at this point um, and have a lot of features that I will get into a little bit later. Um, and that's also a great way. And CephFS is sort of new to the scene. It's been declared stable upstream in April. And funnily enough, um, Ceph actually started with the goal of being a distributed POSIX compliant file system. 
And Ceph has been around since 2004-ish, 2005. <laughs> And CephFS is actually the last part of the stack to be stable because it turns out distributed file systems are kind of hard. Um, so that took a while to mature. And even there for CephFS, so SUSE recommends that you stick to non-metadata intensive workloads, you know, the usual when you introduce a new file system, right? You don't use every feature of the file system immediately. You use it for large files. You don't use it for, you know, lots of small files that constantly change because that's simply not what file systems are most efficient at. And then it also has a low-level RADOS access mechanism that you probably shouldn't use unless you're an application developer and want to write a new layer on top of, you know, Ceph. Um, so that is sort of like a very high-level run-through. But I actually wanted to talk not so much about Ceph itself, but how to make it dependable. Um, and before we can do that, we need to briefly look at what dependability actually is. So dependability is a great term that's not very commonly used in sales literature because it's very extensive. So because it doesn't actually include performance, right? Normally when you talk about storage, you have everyone giving you IOPS and throughput and you know, capacity, and that's not what dependability is. Dependability means availability, so your system is up when you want it to be up. It means reliability, that yeah, it actually does what you want it to do. Uh, durability is sort of specific to storage. It means the data is actually around for a bit, um, to simplify that a little. Um, and safety means it fails in ways that don't, you know, cause harm to the environment. And a questionable point is also whether maintainability is part of dependability. If your system is around for a long time, you need to be able to maintain and support it, right? So these are factors that are often overlooked when you're building a storage system, because you tend to optimize, okay, I need this much capacity at this price point with this performance. Um, dependability is really important because you can't lose your data. Um, and so I want to talk about a few of the factors that affect this. and. This also affects performance, but we'll get there. Um, before we discuss the technology, though, let's address the elephant in the room. Or maybe, I don't know if you have toxic elephants in Australia. I don't know what the local equivalent would be. But um, do you know what the biggest threat to, the, to these things is? I, I was thinking all of you, but uh, you are all fine. It's him. So thank you. Exactly. So yeah, the most outages are caused by humans. You know, humans are the problem, in case you hadn't noticed. Um, the question is, what can you do about that? And that's not what this talk is about, but I really need to give it a shout out. Um, you're already here, so hopefully you're taking away something, not just from me, but from the rest of the conference. There are many great aspects here. Um, there's training available. Um, documentation, Ceph has actually pretty good upstream documentation. It's really useful. Um, turns out that sometimes the docu upstream documentation is technically correct but misleading. We've had one or two of those incidents. So in that case, we appreciate feedback and pull requests not just on the code but on the documentation to make it clear what it actually means, because the programmer reads it and goes like, yeah, that's exactly what it does. That's uh, described, you know, as a boundary parameter. And a casual user goes and, oh, no, this means something else. So that's really important feedback for us to have as well. And of course, you know, there's a bunch of people you can team with the community. You can, you know, there's a bunch of consulting organizations over. This is not a sales talk. But if you're deploying Ceph, you probably have a business need. You don't usually deploy a multi-petabyte solution because you're feeling bored unless you get paid to develop them, which is awesome. Um, but it really, at some point in time, it's not a shame to admit that it, you know, everyone is in over the head. Like the Dunning-Kruger effect, I definitely had that when we got started on Zephyr. It's like, how hard can this be? I've been doing distributed systems for 20 years. And then we did storage, uh, that was fun. Um, so yeah, so there's people out there to help you, right? But that said, let's get into the technology. Um, and the biggest question first is, you know, when you, when you build a system, how do you build it? Mostly people go to one partner and one hardware supplier and buy the same hardware 20 times or, you know, however many. Um, it is a system administration because all your systems are the same. Components are interchangeable. 
you have lower purchasing costs because you can lean on that one, really, uh, one vendor really hard to give you, you know, good discount. And you have standardized ordering process and all those things that make you know, the business people happy. Um, this is this, uh, this Murphy's Law thingy. And the thing is that at scale, everything fails. And um, the side effect is um, you know, if you have your, all your systems, um, you think you're building a distributed system, so you think you're protecting yourself against failures, right? That's the point of having a distributed system. You don't have a single point of failure, right? You have this redundancy built in. Um, but distributed systems have one shortcoming, and they are still vulnerable to correlated failures. And guess what you're doing when you're buying the same hardware 100 times from the same vendor in, you know, Oh, yeah, it's really great. They're all running the same network driver, the same hard drive. Uh, it's really awesome. We got serial number one, two, three, four, five. Um, yeah, this is not so good, right? So we do see this a lot. We see this in the field that when you have the same hardware from one vendor and the hard drives have been manufactured, I mean, even my RAID system at home has been bitten by that twice. You would think I had learned after the first time. You buy the same hard drive twice and you get close serial numbers and will fail within you know, a certain time window of each other because that's how hardware works. They expose to the same level of stress and they fail at the same time. So you have correlated failures and your distributed system isn't worth, bless you, um, isn't worth the money you spent to build it, um, at least not in that regard. So heterogeneous deployments. It's, actually, it's interesting. Diversity, diversity is really cool. Not, you know, it's, this is, you know, it's a theme at this conference, and I find this really amazing that Linux Conf AU manages to be so diverse compared to the other conferences. Um, and we are, you know, hardware, we are all, you know, we have all our quirks, but everything is broken differently. That's the secret, right? So when you mix and match, you get some advantage out of doing that. Diversity is great. Mo monoculture sucks, right? Um, and you know, homogeneous culture, it's not sustainable anyway, right? It's, you, you buy all your hardware on day one. Awesome. What happens on day two? Some hardware fails a year later. Are you going to buy the exact same hardware? Yes, if you're the government, you will, because you, know, you have this contract and you don't care what your hardware costs because you're spending other people's money. Um, but most other people will buy what's appropriate a year down the line or three years down the line. So your cluster is around for a bit. And it's very unlikely you will be able to even get the same hardware, right? So you're going to get uh, heterogeneous deployments anyway. And um, requirements change, so you're adjusting the system as you build it out. So you might as well, you know, system is going to end up heterogeneous anyway. And if it's something is unavoidable, you might as well embrace it, right? Um, so how can you build heterogeneous modes into your system without you know, being overwhelmed by the complexity that that obviously creates, right? And maybe there are some places where it's actually not possible. Um, another point is that failure is unavoidable as well, right? But you don't really have to necessarily suffer. Um, I, I take a lot of pride from, I, I, well, engineers focus on things that can go wrong, right? So HA and storage is great for me because there are so many things can go wrong. But if you want uptime, you really need to look at the things that threaten that, right? You need to architect your system to survive a single or multiple failures. Mostly people test, for example, performance while the system is all fine and running, right? That's great. You, you know, you build this, it performs, it's awesome, right? And then something goes wrong and you just lost a bunch of your capacity a bun and in a scale out solution, if you lose a certain amount of nodes, you also lose some performance and there's recovery. Every RAID system has it, right? It rebuilds and suddenly, you know, you overcommitted your hardware and you fail. So that's something to take into account. Test under load, test all those um, bad behaviors. In our internal testing, we call this basically sunny day testing and rainy day testing. Um, Sometimes the terms are a little bit more explicit. Um, because it doesn't really help that the system works while everything is fine. At scale, nothing is ever fine, right? If you have a, 
if you have a thousand drives, you have drives failing every other day. Your system is constantly rebuilding. The fact that it works fine if it wasn't rebuilding doesn't help you in production. Um, and there comes a point where you have to say, okay, I don't care, right? This is beyond my, my scale because availability and durability are not free, right? If you look at HPC, you, you leverage every last tiny bit of your performance of your system, which is what you do when you're performance tuning. Um, with availability, you're basically building in redundancy, which is a euphemism for capacity that you don't always need. And sometimes you can say that, okay, if this, 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 and this goes wrong, it's just too expensive to protect against. So, so basically know your threat envelope and you know, your exposure that you actually want to protect against. Um, and there's, this is, I have, it sounds great because exponential, everyone is scared of exponential growth. I have actually no, I'm not perfectly sure, but it seems, you know, it seems to ring true. So as soon as you add another order of magnitude to your availability going to say from 99% to 99.9%, um, typically your price will double, right? And you can already figure out that it's impossible to go to 100%, um, even though you can burn a lot of money in the process of trying. Um, which maybe if you're in consulting is exactly what you want to do. Um, and Scaleout actually does make some things easier because a lot of these features are built in. Um, so that is a fairly high level view. Um, what does this, how do you actually translate this in practice to, you know, to your hardware environments? Um, and that's you know, what the next slide of this talk is about, or well, the next couple of slides. So I already said that you should embrace diversity, you know, for a number of good reasons, but there's a problem. You know, most algorithms, like we had this 2n plus 1 formula a little bit earlier, most algorithms require a majority vote. A majority vote doesn't mean 49%, it doesn't mean 50.0%, it means 50.1 or you know, just above the 50% threshold. This is not the US election, this is an algorithm that goes like, I don't have the majority, I don't know what to do. And so if you can't establish a clear majority, um, so that means if you have two different kinds of hardware, and one of, assume worst case scenario, all the hardware from one supplier completely fails. You're still stuck at 50%, what do you do, right? This is not enough. Um, so, you could look at using three suppliers. Of course, that means you have to deal with three suppliers or three different kinds of hardware. Um, that may be f feasible for some components. Um, you may even look at multiple architectures, mixing Intel, Power, ARM. System Z is not so interesting for scale-out software solutions as a host, um, kind of expensive. Um, but so you could do that. We have some customers who do that. Um, when they have the right regulatory environments, but maybe this is actually the case where you go like, okay, so many things go wrong, I give up. Um, or you go, okay, 50% failed, so I have to manually intervene and say, okay, yes, it's okay to proceed. I can't build this in. This is a point in time where I actually need a human to make a call and go, okay, you're still on the good side, right? Um, and you actually don't want to just mix the hardware, you want to mix them geographically. You don't want to have all your Intel hardware in this rack and all your ARM hardware in this rack and then you know, one of the racks fails. You, know, this, you want to mix that so that your redundancy is actually capable of being maintained even if you have some failures. Um, yeah, and again, this could be tricky because you have trouble running so many different power supplies, right? In a data center, you may not be able to have every rack on its own power supply. So there's practical limits to what you can do, unfortunately. Um, and that brings me back to the hardware choices. So you have decided that you want multiple hardware pieces. So what hardware do you actually use? A lot of vendors have reference architectures. Um, a lot of hardware vendors offer turnkey solutions and everyone looks at you cross-eyed when you ask them to mix and match. Can I, you know, hey, um, Dell, can I mix you with HPE hardware? Or Fujitsu? Or, and the, every, the hardware vendor goes like, are you? Uh, I want the whole account, right? So it can be tricky. There's no reference architecture that actually tells you how to mix and match. That's something that you typically have to develop um, with your consulting partner or in-house, right? So that's, uh, that's tricky. And hardware certification also reduces the risk because things go wrong. 
Um, and that, again, means typically the hardware vendors, for some reason, certify their own hardware and not in combination with others. Right? So they, and the hardware combination matrix may not cover everything that you want to mix and match. So again, you have certain limits on what you can do. And unfortunately, small variations can have a huge impact. Um, everyone loves war stories, right? So we had one customer who deployed a reference architecture that was written a year ago. They bought the same hardware. They bought the next version of the network card and the next version of the switch. Fast forward six months, and we have finally fixed the firmware bug on that particular driver with that particular network card, with that particular switch that would, under some circumstances, generate short package that would uh, trigger a kernel panic on all the nodes every 30, well, not on all the nodes at the same time, but basically on every node every two minutes. And you can't build enough redundancy into your system to protect against that. They bought all the same NICs, all the same network cards, and connected them all to the same switches, obviously. And it was like, it seemed like a usual good thing from the customer to do, right? They bought the next generation of the hardware. And it really, hardware is hard. Firmware is hard. And when you have to look at binary-only firmware in combination with switches that you don't control, the certification matrix explodes. So if you're going down that route, you're actually better off ignoring what I just said about diversity and sticking exactly to the hardware that was tested. Because the diversity you're trying to build in also means that you're hitting new errors that no one has hit before um, boldly. And it can really slow down yeah, your product. So um, again, so basically don't put all X in one basket. Um, I already mentioned that. Um, don't put them all into the same rack. Mix, mix and match that, right? Um, and there's another component in Ceph that's really important. It's the monitors. I said they're not performance critical, but you have to somehow decide how many you need, right? People want to often build 5, 10, 20, 30, because they think this is a scale-out component as well. And it's really not. The monitors are not performance critical. And normally, you're good enough with protecting against the outage of a single monitor. So typically, three is a good number for the monitors, as long as you distribute those across your rack. If they're all above each other, it's probably not so smart. Um, large environments may choose to use something like five or seven, but I've never seen a customer run more than five or seven because there's just no practical need. Um, quick thing on hyperconvergence, it's a really great thing. Everyone wants to slap everything on the same hardware. It also means that all your components that are on that piece of hardware fail at the same time. So from a dependability aspect, if you have monitors, gateways, OSDs, and part of the workload on the same piece of hardware. The recovery, in theory, it will work, but in practice will take longer because all those different layers have to recover at the exact same time while the other layers haven't recovered yet because they're also recovering. So in general, we recommend that you don't correlate especially the monitors with other nodes. You know, you don't converge those because they are really important. So again, convergence is great. It saves cost, but it comes at a price as well. Um, storage diversity, uh, just, let, just let's assume that you don't want to deploy desktop drives in your hardware, right? And I already mentioned that bit about sequential serial numbers. A funny thing here, mount them at different angles if you're paranoid, right? We had customers that went like, they had to have construction outside, and all the servers went like this. And that was not good. The hard drives didn't like that. Some of the hard drives were, some, were by accident mounted like this, and they survived because they weren't like this, and that was fine. So you can get really, really paranoid about how to build these things. Um, SSDs are particularly fun because they wear out. They are great on day one. You know, the desktop drives, awesome performance, right? And then you hit those write cycles, and they degrade in performance, and you have a lot of problems. Um, Storage node sizing, you don't want to build big nodes, right? If you build big nodes, you have three nodes, and basically that's all your storage. You lose one of those nodes, you just lost 33% of your capacity and, and performance, right? So we recommend in general that a single node should not be more than 10% of your total capacity and bandwidth, right? Um, and you should also make sure that you have three capacity that's larger than the largest single node. Because otherwise, that node fails. The cluster will try to rebuild, and it doesn't have the space to do so because it, has, it doesn't have the space to build up the redundant copies again. Right? 
And redundant copies are a good point. I really want to get that in still. So Ceph has two basic modes of replicating data. So the first one is repl pure bitwise replication. And that's easy, right? That's what we're all familiar with since the RAID 1 days. You have one master copy and you know, additional bit identical copies. That's great, but it's also it's a huge overhead. And there's also erasure coding, which basically breaks your data up in several chunks and then computes a bunch of other parity chunks and can recover from that. And that can configure, can survive any number of outages and has a fractional overhead of m over k. So that, that's really great. I have some slides to illustrate that. So durability, three-way applications, this is cool. Um, yeah, your one bit of data now lives on three drives, and you can lose any one of them and still have the data, or maybe even two, depending on how you configure this. If you have, yeah, so that basically means usable capacity of your cluster is now 33%. Yes, thank you. And you can survive two faults. Now let's look at the same thing with four plus three erasure coding. You have your piece of data, you split it into four chunks, and you comp compute three <coughs> parity chunks. Um, usable capacity is suddenly up to 57%, so a huge safe space saving. Um, and you can actually survive three faults. So you have less overhead and better durability. That's awesome. This is a great improvement. It's sort of like going from RAID 1 to RAID 5 or RAID 6, right? Just more flexible. Um, so why would you not want to do this? Well, recovery, unfortunately, now needs to read them all because it has to, well, a, you know, a fair bunch of them. So it kind of just replicates the data again. It has to actually read the data run pretty expensive algorithms to reconstruct the missing chunks and rebuild. So and you, that limits your scalability. And also in a Ceph cluster, not all features work on erasure coded pools because of that overhead. So um, cache tiering is a fairly advanced feature. And you know, given the left time left, I have to skip that for a moment. I will talk about that for a moment. Um, so basically, what I'm trying to say is you can't just, there's no single answer for how you want to configure RAID in your cluster, you know, there's a um, certain limit to, um, to the uniform deployments that you have. So you need to look at what exactly your durability requirements are and what overhead you're willing to pay and what the performance cost of that is. So erasure coded pools are great, but they cost you performance and yet they are more durable. So what do you want in practice, right? Um, Ceph will actually go through the data and find bad data, but at the same time, this is scrubbing means that you're losing performance that's now used for scrubbing because you're losing some data for the housekeeping of Ceph, uh, some bandwidth that's now used for the um, housekeeping. So that, again, is also costly and still necessary if you want to find bad data without having to access it all the time. Um, Automatic fault dis uh, detection and recovery, you may actually want to turn this off in some situations when you know that you're going to do something to the cluster that probably the cluster might detect as a fault. Um, that's really important during maintenance windows and during upgrades, you may want to just turn this off. That's uh, often overlooked, but can really, you know, otherwise the cluster shoots itself. Network architecture, same thing, multiple switches, multiple NICs in the same server, and cross-connect them so you don't have a single point of failure on one of the cards. Again, so same thing, diversity. So that's actually possible. That's fairly simple. You can combine two network interface cards. You shouldn't have all the same network interface cards in your servers. Um, and use last year's network cards. Last year's network cards probably at this point in time have been debugged. <laughs> um, yeah, that's unfortunate, but true. Um, gateway configuration uh, consideration. Some of the gateways are traditional client server protocols. So Ceph is client cluster. So the Ceph protocol itself knows how to talk to a cluster. You don't have to do anything special to build an availability there. But if you're like using NFS or iSCSI, you need to architect that so that you have a scale out solution there. Um, you can use load balances, multipass, but then you again have to, you know, build in the failover parts there. It's again, and again, test whether you still have your throughput numbers while not all the gateways are up. Right. Configuration drift, really great. Um, admins get things wrong. If you manually edit your servers, you're doing it wrong. Um, use salt. This is, I mean, or Ansible, Puppet, Chef, CF Engine, whatever, right? But don't manage your servers manually. Put it under revision control and roll them out automatically. Um, this is 2017. There's really no excuse. Um, that, that's basically the simple thing. But at this point in time, everyone should have that. Um, 
Otherwise, I have no sympathy. <laughs> uh, trust, verify, monitor your system. We heard that several times. What is not monitored is not managed. And what's not managed and monitored is probably broken. Um, you know, manage capacity utilization, manage how your SSDs wear down, because sometimes vendors lie, um, and react to those issues in a timely fashion, right? So it's a have actionable data. Um, updates, updates are great. Um, and I already told you to not always run the latest edge code. Obviously, for software, this is different. We are not hardware, right? The latest software is always the best. So apply the update a month after it's been out, right? So um, because they fix bugs and they fix a lot of stability issues, even those that you haven't hit yet. Um, and maintenance updates that come from vendors are not always a bad thing. You know, there's actually a lot of effort that goes into testing those for the distributions and everything. Um, and you can do this with the Ceph cluster because it allows you to do rolling upgrades. You can update one node after the other without taking the whole service down because you have architected your system so you have enough bandwidth to do that while one of the services is rebooting, right? Um, so that's great. So with the Ceph cluster, you can just, you know, you know, have, you know, the operating system eat the bugs. Um, don't trust anyone, right? Updates come from upstream. They come from distributions. I don't care. Don't trust them, right? They, that's not a sales pitch, so you can tell. Um, you should test them yourself. The test matrix in reality is so huge that it's impossible for a vendor to test all, any project to test all possible combinations of all hardware, all features, all software. It's, impos it's impossible. It's not, it's not, it's, yeah. Um, so you it ideally want a reduced version of your production environment or to match it as closely as you possibly can. And at least nowadays, you can test it in a virtualized environment, at least, you know, maybe not the hardware interactions, but the, the raw functionality. You really have no excuse to not have a staging environment today. You can host it on the cloud if you want to. Um, and also test your processes on that thing. Don't just test the process, uh, the hardware, uh, the software, but also the process that you use to run out, uh, to run those um, updates. And long-term attainability, I don't have to tell that to anyone at um, LCA, but use open source or free software and avoid vendor lock-in, right? A traditional hardware vendor wants you, or storage vendor wants you to have everything on their hardware. Don't do that. It's not a good place to be. Um, in summary, Disaster, well, not quite yet in summary, but I'm getting close. Disaster will strike. It can't. It, it's not a hypothetical thing. Eventually, it will fail, right? So make sure you also have backups. A Ceph cluster does not replace your backup strategy. And try your recovery methods. Try your fire drills and see if it actually works, right? That's, that's something nobody wants. Who in here wants backups? OK, you have heard that too often, right? Everyone wants recovery. So um, yeah, no one wants backups. They are slow, but you really want recovery. So most important rule is really avoid compl complexity, right? Um, and yeah, this does not mean that you shouldn't test everything and see if it help, works in your environment. So be aggressive in what you test but be very conservative in what you deploy. You know, test everything and then, you know, what do you need to meet your goals? Um, test all the features and deploy what you need, right? That's, that's basically, if you take away one slide, it's this one, right? You know, limit yourself. Avoid complexity. Complexity is the enemy of reliability, right? So don't panic because we are here to help. So that exhausts the slides I have, and now I'm happy to take as many questions as we, as you can stomach before eating. Okay, one question there. Thanks for the talk. You talked about petabytes of storage under Ceph. Yes. What's the starting point for Ceph? Where does it not make sense for organizations to be looking at Ceph? Okay, so where does Ceph not make sense? That's a good question. Um, from my point of view, Ceph doesn't make sense if you can fit all your storage into a single server. Sometimes we have people approach us with, oh, we have huge data needs, big data. And then we find out that there was somebody who, like me, grew up in the 80s and thinks that 10, peta, 10 terabytes is a huge amount of data. And I go, like, buy two hard drives. So it's not, Ceph is a scale out solution. So it makes sense when you actually have more storage than you can fit into a single server. You know, when, when you have the point in time where you actually need five servers to hold all the disks, then it makes sense to use Ceph, because then you have the benefits of scale-out 
So you should use Ceph when you don't have the alternative not to. Because Ceph as a distributed storage solution is complicated. By necess it's necessarily complicated. Right? So if you don't need that, you shouldn't be doing that. Okay. More questions? You're all hungry. I, 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 I relate. Morning tea was impressive. Okay, thanks. I will be around. So if you have any more questions. Very good. Please give me a Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh. Extra stuff as well.